Hey, it's me, Nalthazar, and welcome to another Magic the Gathering Puzzle Quest video. In today's video, I'm going to be going over Sarah the Benevolent, a brand new mono-white planeswalker entering Puzzle Quest. So, let's get into it. A really quick shout out here at the beginning, I want to give a special thanks to Octagon for sending me this Planeswalker so I could test it out and make this video for you guys. So if uh, you're watching this at the studios, thank you guys so much for your support. I, I really appreciate you guys. So Sarah the Benevolent, this is a brand new mono white Planeswalker. She has the super sweet plus seven, plus three, plus three mana bonus spread at level 60. Her three abilities are going to be Angelic Destiny, Sarah Archangel, and Angelic Renewal. You can tell from the names alone of the abilities that Sarah is an angel-themed planeswalker. She is very unique. She is very different from pretty much any other planeswalker that we have in the game, and that definitely makes her really fun. The first ability, Angelic Destiny at level 60, is going to make it so that target creature you control gets plus four, plus four, that's permanently and gains first strike permanently and flying permanently and permanently gains the angel subtype. So all the things that that ability gives are permanent buffs. The plus four, plus four, first strike, flying and gaining the angel subtype. Now the creature gaining the angel subtype is going to be really important for the second ability. The second ability, Sarah Archangel, is going to create a radiant Sarah Archangel token. Then your other angel creatures are going to get a permanent plus three plus three buff and bravery. Now that Radiant Sarah Archangel token is going to be a 6-4 flying angel with leader angel. Meaning that whenever another angel token enters the battlefield, it will instead reinforce Sarah Archangel. And this creature will also have, when an angel creature you control attacks, this creature gets plus two, plus two, and gains protection from the opponent's planeswalker colors until the beginning of your next turn. So by giving all your other angel, to angel creatures bravery from activating the second ability, the other angels are likely to be going ahead of the Radiant Sarah Archangel token which means that you will be able to get up to a plus four, plus four buff every time it attacks from your other angels. Now, this second ability is going to synergize incredibly well with the first ability because the first ability is going to make it so that you can turn any creature you control into an angel, which means that you can turn any token stack you control into an angel token stack. So let's say that you had a massive stack of human tokens because you have a bunch of cards that make humans. Then you use the first ability on those humans. Those humans are all going to become angels. And then when you play the Sarah Archangel from the second ability, then that leader is then going to eat up all those human tokens and take them all as reinforcements for itself. Now a leader that has six power, uh, so this six four power toughness, uh, base power toughness on a leader is one of the highest base power toughnesses that we have on a leader in the game. And so this makes the token incredibly strong on its own, but then having the ability to turn any other token into an angel so that your leader from your second ability is able to eat them up is very nifty. The third ability is angelic renewal. And with that, you're going to create an angelic renewal token. That angelic renewal token is going to be an emblem with four shields. And when a non-token creature you control dies, you may exile it. So you get to choose whether or not to exile it. Then, when a creature card is exiled from your graveyard, create a Vigilant Angel token. And then finally, when you foretell a card from your hand, create a Vigilant Angel token. Now, when one of your creatures dies, you are able to exile it. And when you exile it, you do get that Vigilant Angel token. If your opponent is playing some kind of like mass graveyard exile against you, and then you happen to have a bunch of creatures in your exile, and you've got this third ability down, you will get a bunch of Vigilant Angel tokens for it. If you play a deck that has some foretell cards in it, when you foretell cards from your hand, you're going to create those Vigilant Angel tokens. So 
all of the abilities really are going to be synergizing around angels. And then after you create this emblem, you're also going to get a bonus effect for activating angelic renewal. You're going to exile each creature card from your graveyard. Then you gain two life for each cleric exiled this way, and your angel creatures get plus one, plus one for each warrior exiled this way. Now, white doesn't have a whole bunch of ways to load a whole bunch of creatures up into your graveyard apart from things with defender or things of the like. So you're probably not going to get too much use out of the exile each creature card from your graveyard portion, nor are you going to be gaining much life or giving your angels any significant buff from the follow effects. Really the only reason you would be creating the angelic renewal token is to actually get the token itself and then you go from there. Now you might notice that the formatting of this visually is a little bit different from my usual Planeswalker showcase videos. And the reason for that is because I wanted to draw your attention to Sarah's abilities at lower levels. So I initially tried to record with Sarah at level 30 and then record with Sarah at level 60 just so I could get a split of lower level Sarah and higher level Sarah. But the problem with her abilities, if you want to play her at a lower level, you'll notice that Angelic Destiny doesn't actually change a creature subtype to an angel until level three. And the Sarah Archangel isn't actually going to create that Radiant Sarah Archangel token also until rank three. And so you're gonna have all three of your abilities at rank three at level 46. And since Sarah the Benevolent is a monocolored planeswalker, it's only gonna cost you about 80,000 runes to level her up to level 60, as opposed to if you were to try and level up a dual or a tricolor or colorless planeswalker, which would cost double or quadruple the runes. But for this one, she really doesn't work too well at lower levels if you're trying to take advantage of her abilities. Now her mana gains are phenomenal across the board. So if you wind up getting her and you can't level her up, and you just want her for her mana gains until you're able to level her up to max level, then that's fine. Her mana gains are exceptional throughout. But if you're getting her and you want to be able to take full advantage of her kit, you do need to get her at the very least into those mid 40s. So you've got the level three unlocked for her first and her second ability, as those are really what are going to be driving this Planeswalker. Now for the decks that I wound up using with this walker, uh, I wound up actually making a popper deck, sort of, right, to show you all that you can uh, see how does this Planeswalker work with just popper cards. And then I made a deck that I really didn't expect to be any good. It's just I was doing a lot of tinkering with this Planeswalker. I played a heck of a lot of matches with her. Um, and so while I was tinkering around with her, I was like, you know what? What if I just take all the different cards that I have in Standard that make Angel tokens and throw them into one deck and I can't begin to tell you how pleasantly surprised I was with this deck. I had an absolute blast with a bunch of cards that honestly I would have probably never really gotten any use out of had I not been playing with this Planeswalker and making this video for you guys. So I'm really thrilled that I had the opportunity to make and use this deck. So in the gameplay, you're going to wind up seeing this deck here as my deck for people that have more established collections. And then you're going to see this deck here for my popper collection. At the conclusion of this video, so if you wanna just jump from the timestamps, the conclusion, I'm going to be going over my general thoughts for this Planeswalker. And then uh, I'm going to get into a little bit about like collection and how you might wanna build around her and how do I feel about the third ability in particular, Angelic Renewal. So let's get into that gameplay so you can see some of that good fun stuff. So let's let's start with the popper deck. Now in my popper deck, you'll see that I'm running a white human build. And so the idea that I had here was to try and look through my collection and see what was the most consistent token producer in the common, uncommon, and rare range. And I found that there really are a lot of cards that are going to be able to produce these white human tokens. And so I decided to try this deck out here. There's really one card in this deck that doesn't actually fit, and it is the Omen, because the Omen actually produces a different type of human that you are going to see momentarily. I'm also trying to run as heavy of gem conversion as I can, because with this Planeswalker, you desperately need gem conversion because her mana gains are so high in white. 
So you really get a lot out of her for doing that. Now, this match I'm up against Teferi, and Teferi's a little bit scary when you're trying to play a token deck because Teferi's first ability just bounces a critter with a mana cost of, I think it's 13 or less, but with the token, that just means it auto kills it because there's going to be no room in your hand for that token to go. So that turn wound up being pretty advantageous for me. I did get out a gem converter, which is pretty good. And then I drew into another one. Now my opponent did play Kenrith and that is a little bit scary. I definitely don't want Kenrith to stay on the battlefield. So I'm looking here to see if I can find a white or green or a blue match as those are the match colors that Sarah would be able to cast the dire tactics that I have in my hand but I, I don't see any, so I'm just going to go ahead and take a hit from Kenrith here and call it good. Hope I can do something next turn instead. And so, sure enough, I get a very good conversion there, and then I've got a white match that I can definitely make to be able to play my Castle Ardenvale, to play the Dire Tactics, to get rid of Kenrith, and then play Omen of the Sun. And here's where you're going to see that Omen of the Sun plays different human tokens, right? So as it's a different kind of human token, that means that I would have to use my first ability separately on my stack of tokens with five reinforcements and my stack of tokens with one reinforcement in order to be able to put all of them on the angel that I ultimately am trying to get toward. So uh, here I'm just checking my loyalty and then I'm going to use my first ability on my token stack with six reinforcements. Oh, sorry, five reinforcements, there are six of them. It's a little bit dangerous to do that just because Te Teferi has uh, his first ability here. And so it's very possible that Teferi would use it on my token stack, but I did actually wind up playing my knight here in hopes that Teferi would see an uncommon creature instead of the common tokens and be like, you know what I'm going to do with my first ability? I'm going to bounce that 3-3 back to your hand because, you know, Teferi does some foolish things sometimes. So I am going to hold on to my Staggering Insight here. It's very tempting to use it to get some lifelink, but at the same time, I'm ultimately going to choose not to in the hopes that I'll be able to get my Angel token down next turn. I did make a white into loyalty match there. And so really just if I get one gem conversion to give me a match here at the start of my turn, I should be able to turn my token stack into a really big angel. So I've got 11 little critters down. So that means it should be at least at 66 power if I'm able to do that this turn. And unfortunately I am not unless I make a five match. So I'll have to wait, I'll have to wait one more turn, but that's really not the end of the world. I do have I do have the staggering insights in my hand to be able to give me some lifelink. So uh, I did actually have a loyalty match, a five loyalty match up in the left hand corner, and then in my cold riddled brain, I did not make that match, which was very foolish. Yes, I have a cold. It's why uh, my voice for this particular part of the match is probably a little bit different than it is for the other parts of the video, uh, just because I wound up recording the different bits at different times and. The cold hit me for this time, so that's just how it is. The way the cookie crumbles. But anyways, I do have my second ability here. So here's where we get to see the first instance of the second ability. You get to see that little stack of critters actually turn into a big stack of angel, which is going to be really nice. And then I've got a worthy knight if I want, but ultimately I'm not going to go ahead uh, and, and be able to do too much with that. Uh, I do I do actually get three more of the humans down, which is perfect. So now I'm going to go ahead and use my second ability, and you'll see that it immediately eats up all those little human tokens, and now my little humans become a 90-60. As you can imagine, I'm sweating bullets here just a little bit because I'm kind of worried that Teferi is going to bounce my angel token. I very much do not want Teferi to bounce my angel token, but nonetheless, I still got to show you how big the angel token can get. So let's see if Teferi is smart or if Teferi is going to be foolish. The answer is foolish. By making a match, Teferi opted not to use his first ability, and so we are going to be able to kill Teferi this turn with the 90 power angel. So I'm going to go ahead and put Staggering Insight on it, even though there's no point. It's not actually going to give me any life but it is going to make it fun to be able to make my angel as big as possible. So as you can see, you can make really powerful creatures even if you don't have a lot of good cards in your collection because this Planeswalker is able to make really any creature type that you're able to make tokens of into an absolute juggernaut powerhouse. So 
this is the generally popper plus rares build. Let's go ahead and get into some of the builds for more established collections. For this next match, I'm going to be going up against Daxos with my uh, Mythic Heavy deck. Now, here's the thing, right? I get a lot of messages, just, you know, from time to time, that are, Nalthazar, we always see you winning. I want to see I want to see you lose. I want to see that you're just a normal player. And I really actually don't lose that often. So I, I really don't have, like, any good footage of that. Uh, but this was a match in which I got really close to losing. So I don't actually lose it, but I got really close to losing. Now, that the reason I'm showing you guys this match instead of some match where I pop off and do crazy things is because this just shows how resilient the Sarah Planeswalker can be. So this just shows you a totally different side of Sarah. What happens when everything goes wrong? Now, I say what happens when everything goes wrong, because as you're going to see, Daxos just gets the most ridiculous matches in this, this game. It, it it's, it's mildly unfair. And on top of that, you'll see that I actually don't have any decent horizontal matches to be able to play uh, my angel tokens. So I can't, even, I can't even get my land down here, which is really unfortunate, because with Sarah, you desperately need to have lands on the battlefield because you need the gem conversion so she she really needs that white conversion so here uh, i will be able to get the amaria's call down so i'm going to go ahead and play that i'm going to get i'm going to get my land and so here it's like oh okay now those are you're fine no i'm not look at this look at this <laughs> that's not fine oh man and then oh geez daxos yeah so so daxos kind of popped off there. I'm, I'm pretty lucky that this Daxos deck that I'm up against is really more of a gimmicky deck than it is a power deck with the, the matches that Daxos got here, but nonetheless, uh, it's okay. So at this stage, right, I'm still not too worried. I've already got some gem conversion down. I'm going to get more gem conversion down, and as you see, I've got an Angel of Destiny in my hand. So at this stage, I'm thinking I'm still fine. I've got greater power than my opponent, uh, and then my opponent just Oh my gosh. So not only do they put an inevitable end on my angel tokens, which means they're going to be losing a reinforcement every turn until they die, uh, but then the they got a staggering insight down, and now my opponent has a lot of power. I don't have any real removal in this deck, and so at this stage, I'm just thinking, ah, oh, crud. Now, I'm really hoping that I will be able to get to my second ability very, very soon here, uh, because if I get to my second ability here with Sarah Ascendant, then, sorry, sorry, but the Benevolent, then Sarah is going to create that leader token, and the leader token will eat my little angel token stacks, and so I won't hopefully lose all of them. So getting the white match into the loyalty match was perfect there, so I'm going to be giving Daxos the whappy whappies, and then Daxos for some reason chooses to put the inevitable end on my angel token instead of putting it on uh, my big scary mythic angel, which as you will find out in just a moment was a massive mistake, but nonetheless, that's okay. I'm going to go ahead and play the radiant angel here. And so that's, that's going to eat up my token stack, which is going to prevent me from actually losing my angels. It's going to get rid of the, uh, horrible, super evil, inevitable end. Uh, and so here it's, it's kind of tricky, right? Because I don't actively have any great matches at my disposal. And so I'm trying to figure out what here's the best move. I wind up deciding just to go with the loyalty into red and hope that I will get myself something super wonderful. Uh, by super wonderful, I mean a cascade. I don't, but I do wind up getting myself a little cleric dude who's going to be playing uh, more angel tokens. And then I get this really sweet little uh, cascade right here. So that's really good for me because I was a little bit concerned that I was going to lose the game until that point especially because of how many cards Daxos has fully charged in hand. Uh, so that, that's a little bit on the scary side. And uh, so here I've also got the Seferic Greatsword, which is going to enable me to play even more Angel Tokens if I can get that down. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and play use the Angelic Destiny ability on the Angel of Destiny. I'm doing this because Angel of Destiny has double strike, and so that means that I'm going to be gaining even more life for doing that. Uh, because, right, it's going to be hitting twice instead of just once, so it's kind of like getting double power. I will use the Seferic Greatsword to get yet another set of Angel Tokens. I wind up getting two of them because at the time I used it, I was at lower life. Uh, and now at this stage, Daxos is in a really unhappy place, unless Daxos has Ruinous Ultimatum. 
So Daxos is going to go ahead and play Staggering Insight, and just because of the way that the Heroic works with this deck that Daxos is playing, it's going to buff up all of the creatures, but not quite enough, even though I've given them all lifelink, so they're all hitting me uh, pretty hard. We're having some pretty intense life swings here, but push comes to shove. Uh, this is going to wind up being the end of the match, unfortunately, for Daxos. I don't even need to play the Saga there because I've got it's not going to do anything for me. I've already, I'm already on chapter two. So as my angels attack, they're already going to start destroying Daxos's creatures. So no big deal. I'm going to take the white match there. I wound up getting a super cascade to just sort of be like, ha, I can get one too, Daxos. Uh, and then the angel of destiny is going to swing in. It's going to kill the Adolon. The great sword is going to go ahead and give me another angel token, which really doesn't matter because this is enough power to clean Daxos out. So that's an example of Sarah the Benevolent being able to make, you know, enough power with your kit and then come back for some pretty bad, pretty bad situations. Let's take a look at one more bonus match. I wanted to throw in this bonus match because I feel like neither of the previous matches really showcased just how absurd Sarah's abilities can be if you are running a true token deck. And so in this match, I am indeed running a true token deck. So the idea is that with something like Prismatic Bridge, I can have only one creature in my deck, that one creature being the Militant Angel, which is going to make me a whole bunch of angel tokens because it's going to make, sorry, a number, a bunch of knight tokens, right? Uh, because it's going to wind up making a number of tokens equal to my white mana bonus, which is seven, which means that every other turn, I'm going to ideally be getting seven more of those knight tokens. I say every other turn because half of the time it'll pull another prismatic bridge. As you see, I get an Asika, and the other half of the time it's going to go ahead and pull me another militant angel, which will give me the knights. So I'm going to go ahead and really quickly turn those knights into angels so that if I can use my second ability, I'll be able to get sweet good goodies out of it. I've already activated the land forming by making a horizontal match. So playing the Amarius call here is really going to be no big deal. It's going to give me a gem converter down. It's going to give me some more loyalty because of Whirlwind of Thought. And then it's also going to give me, you know, the, the angel tokens, which are super sweet, sweet goodness. Now here I've got Conqueror's Pledge. I've got the Ameria in my hand. And so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually hold off on playing the Conqueror's Pledge here. I'm trying to see how much loyalty I have to see if there's any way that I'll be able to use my second ability next turn. So really, as long as I make a loyalty match here, I'll be able to play the angel tokens uh, or I'll be able to play the angel leader and eat up both the knights and the angel tokens that I have on the battlefield right now. Uh, and I'm deliberating a little bit extra because I really wanted to play the conqueror's pledge and try and make a super stack of angels. So that's just sort of what was going through my head in that moment. Uh, Dome replays the absolute nonsense Uro. I get my second militant angel which brings me up to 17 knight tokens, which are actually angels now. I've got the Conqueror's Pledges, which are perfect, so I'm going to try and situate those in my hand so that I can kick them and get as many tokens down as possible. I'm going to play the Radiant Sarah, which just immediately eats the tokens and becomes a 120-80, uh, which is just absolutely absurd. Like You can get this token up so high. Like I've gotten it up into like the, the, the higher hundreds pretty easily. Uh, because of nonsense like Conqueror's Pledge. But here I'm going to go ahead and kick the Conqueror's Pledge, uh, which is going to boost me up to the 18 core tokens. And then I don't think I'm able to kick the second one, uh, which means that I'm going to be stuck with, you know, a, a kicked 18 and then uh, nine more for 27. But that's really no big deal. Uh, I'm able to make another knight token, but I, I don't want another knight token. Uh, I'm going to swing and then this means that if Domri doesn't kill me, then I kill Domri. Now, unfortunately, uh, you're going to notice that I I play this out. Unfortunately, so here's here's what here's one of like my, my, my biggest beef actually with this planeswalker. So I have my first ability. I'm gonna use Angelic Destiny here on the core tokens, and you notice that the core tokens don't immediately get converted into the angel leader. So the angel leader doesn't eat those tokens up until the beginning of your turn. 
So even though I've turned them into angels, it doesn't actually count as if I have those angels as tokens for purposes of the leader until my next turn. So nonetheless, uh, Domri is still going to die here, but it means I don't get to add 27 extra stacks to my angel. And that's it for the gameplay. So let's go ahead and get into my conclusion about this walker. And now time for the end, the conclusion, the part you've all been waiting for. Maybe? I don't know. You've made it this far. So probably? Where does Sarah the Benevolent land on my tier list? And what was it that I was talking about earlier about Angelic Renewal and my thoughts on that? And what are my final thoughts on her abilities? And what are some other cool cards that you can pair with her? So firstly, the tier list, because I think that's the part that most people are interested in. I'm going to go ahead and say that I think that Sarah is somewhere in between the A and the B tier of Planeswalkers. I think that she's very solidly in between the two. My gut take was B, but the more that I played with her toward the end of my time with her this week uh, was more toward A. So it's just the way that her first and second ability work, you need to be able to use both of those abilities together, right? So angelic destiny is going to cost you six loyalty sarah archangel is going to cost you 12 loyalty so you need to have 18 loyalty to be able to use the two of them together furthermore you need to make sure that you use the angelic and destiny on one of your other token stacks but as you saw in the gameplay footage earlier if you use angelic destiny on a token stack it's not going to immediately be consumed by the radiant sarah archangel token if you have radiant sarah archangel already out on the battlefield that said, if you use Angelic Destiny first on the token stack, and then you play Sarah Archangel, then, uh, sorry, the Radiant Sarah Archangel, then, then the Radiant Sarah Archangel will immediately eat up that token stack and gain the reinforcements. Now, that means that you're going to have to wait, right? If you play the Archangel first, you're going to have to wait until your next turn to be able to eat up whatever the token stack is, because as soon as your turn starts, it will then apply the leader and the the new tokens that have the angel subtype and it will then fuse them together for the leader mechanic so for some way that leader is programmed it seems to be looking for the new tokens either when it enters the battlefield or at the beginning of each of your turns so just one of those or when a token enters the battlefield right uh, right or when one of those tokens enters the battlefield so you have to be mindful of that now, this means that the Radiant Sarah Archangel token is very susceptible to removal because no matter what you do, for the most part, you're going to have, you're going to give your opponent a turn to get rid of the token that you made. And if you are actually getting a whole bunch of leader stacks into your token, right? So that then your opponent's going to be like, oh, you, you have a whole bunch of stacks down of this massive token. I'm going to go ahead and prioritize killing that. Or if you just have a really big token stack that you've just turned into angels that haven't yet gone into your leader, then the opponent's going to be like, I see a really big stack of tokens. I'm going to kill that anyways. And then your leader doesn't wind up getting the big token stack. So in a lot of my testing, I found that when I was trying to make the Radiant Sarah Archangel token really big, my opponent would wind up killing either the Radiant Sarah Archangel or the token stack. And so I really missed having haste on the Radiant Sarah Archangel token, just as a way of like doing a, a quick whap on my opponent and calling it good. Now, yes, I do know that the Radiant Sarah Archangel token is going to be able to get protection from an opponent's color. In a lot of my testing, I ran some pretty decent removal options, except for, you know, like at the end when I was just playing some gimmicky decks. And so as a result of that, my opponents never really had any creatures down which meant that it wasn't getting hex proof so i found that just the way that the first and second ability worked i feel like it could be a little bit smoother i love how the two of them synergize and i think it's really really cool that when you're playing sarah the benevolent it basically means that you have leader to all creature types in a way because the radiant sarah archangel is almost like a changeling if you if you think of how the first ability works because you can turn anything into an angel and so anything is going to be able to be consumed by that leader and white is the color that is able to make the most tokens in the game pretty much always so like this is a planeswalker that will always be viable now the third ability the angelic renewal ability so for this one 
I have I have I have a number of thoughts on this one. The first one is about Fortel, right? So I did actually play a few matches trying to make Fortel work, but the thing about Fortel is if you go to the cards in Kaldheim and you just type in Fortel, right? And then you 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 take it to just white and colorless because those are the only cards that you're going to be able to use with Sarah. Realistically speaking, you're going to only want to have two creatures in your deck because the third creature is going to be the Sarah token. You do not want to have a fourth creature. And if you if you look at like all the different cards, like I have all of the Fortel cards. I just don't have, you know, this other version of Vega because I have Vega. So I have I have literally all the Fortel cards. And so as I have all the Fortel cards, we've got Glorious Protector, right? This this, this one's a creature and that one's actually pretty solid. But then apart from that, there there really aren't any other good Fortel creatures. So, I mean, you could wind up running something else like this Shepherd of the Cosmos. But, I mean, what, why? You know, it's it's a 4-4. I mean, you wind up getting an Angel token for it, but you, you're not going to be able to take advantage of the returning a creature that costs 8 or less if you're running the Shepherd along with Glorious Protector. Which means that you need to have a bunch of spells in your deck that have Fortel in order to be able to get something out of the Angels. Now, I don't actually like Doomscar, because Doomscar, when it gets returned to your hand after you destroy it, let's say you make a match, you destroy the gem that Doomscar is on, it comes back to your hand, it just immediately casts and destroys all creatures. It does not have a confirmed cancel prompt, which means that if you wind up getting the angel tokens out of this, then this thing's going to happen, and then it's just going to destroy the angels you made. So uh, it's, it's, it's not a really good choice, which means that we have to look at other options for spells, and there are only three spells in white or colorless that you can use. And those are going to be Kaya's Onslaught, which is a solid card. Sternheim Unleashed, which is another solid card. And then Warhorn Blast, which is not a solid card. So realistically speaking, you're going to probably wind up running a maximum of three cards with Fortel in your deck. The Glorious Protector, Sternheim Unleashed, and Kaya's Onslaught. And so as a result of that, you're really not going to have enough in your hand to be able to make sure that you get any real value out of the making angel tokens out of the foretell from that third ability. So uh, that's on Johnny. That is not Sarah. Silly Nalthazar. Come on. Come back. So that was a tangent. Good job, Michael. Good job. Big kudos. So anyways, the, the foretell part of this, I know that there was there was some talk that I saw about like, oh, this third ability is not going to be useful once this planeswalker, uh, once Kaldheim rotates out. Well, if you're playing this walker, let's face it, you're probably not playing this walker for foretell. And if you are playing it for, for playing it for foretell, you're probably just doing it for gimmicks. You're not doing it to make a super powerhouse. If you want this planeswalker to be a powerhouse, you're going to be leaning very heavily on her first and second ability. So... Those are the different abilities that you're going to want to be leaning on. Now, the last part of the video that I wanted to go into are what are some cards to keep your eye out for as you are looking to build with this Planeswalker? So basically what you're going to want to do is you go into your card pool and you're going to want to type in creature token, right? So you, you go here, you, you type in creature token, and then you, you see what comes on up, right? And so I say you see what comes on up because if you've got any cards that are going to be able to pump a bunch of creatures out onto the battlefield, you're going to be able to get quite a lot of value out of this Planeswalker. Now, at the time of my recording this video, Fiblethip is currently running and it's going to, it's uh, the Prismatic Bridge is currently part of Fiblethip's inventory. So if you play Fiblethip uh, and if you played it, you've, you've got the bridge. Everyone should have the bridge. Hopefully everyone has the bridge. If you missed the bridge, I'm legitimately sorry. But it is an amazing card. So you can you can pair any creature that has on entering the battlefield, put creature tokens down, right? So I used Militant Angel. However, this is a masterpiece, and I recognize that not everybody has it as it is a masterpiece. So fear not, there are plenty of other cards that are going to be able to make tokens, right? But if, if we use the, the non-masterpieces, right? Like what if what if we say uh non-masterpiece cards? Let's let's limit this to mythics on down, my dude. What other, what other tokens can we get for Mythics on down, right? Well, all right, so for Mythics on down, we've actually got some pretty fantastic cards in white right now, especially in standard. So I'm actually just going to go ahead and jump on over to the 10 mana section. We have ourselves a wonderful land that is not showing itself. Garen Brig, not Garen Brig. Uh, Garen Brig's the green one. The castle, right? Let, let's go castles. Boom, boom, boom. Here we are. Ordenvale. 
Arden Veil is going to serve as gem conversion, and it's also going to activate gems that are going to make human tokens. Those little human tokens, those little white human tokens are pretty fantastic because there happen to be a lot of cards that make those little white human tokens, right? White human token. We have a lot of cards that make those little white human tokens now, don't we? Look at this. You can make like a reverent hoplite deck that's going to be pumping out those human tokens with Worthy Knight, which is going to be pumping out a bunch of those human tokens. Castle Ardenvale, which is going to be pumping out a bunch of those human tokens. Uh, there's that super sweet common over here. Yep, Rally the Throne, which is going to pump out, you guessed it, more of those human tokens. If you happen to have a lot of like the vanguards and stuff, even though they aren't popping up right now here, the Elspeth vanguards actually pop out human tokens. So you can just get a whole bunch of these human tokens out. Right, Okame Ranger, you use the flip side. This costs six mana. You create three white human tokens. I had a blast actually uh, with a deck that was running just all of these human token cards. I just went boop, 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 human token, human token, human token, human token. Uh, and you'll see that the Okame Ranger is also a knight, which means that with Worthy Knight, it's going to be making, yep, you guessed it, even more human tokens. Uh, you actually can get five human tokens for using the flip side of the adventure and then the Okame Knight actually casting. And then you take all those human tokens and then you basically force feed them Red Bull, right? Let, let's just let's just go ahead and refer to Sarah the Benevolent as the Red Bull Planeswalker, right? Because, I mean, no, I'm not being paid to say this. I have absolutely no affiliation with the company. But basically, you just get to chug a lug all your tokens in that Red Bull and give them wings. And then they become angels. And then if that wasn't enough, you get to play Big Daddy Angel or Big Mommy Angel. You know what? Who's to say what kind of angel this is? I'm not going to be the one who does that. But nonetheless, you get to play the big angel with the big wings that gets to eat all of her babies. That's not a really good way of putting it. Whatever. You know, there's actually an animal in the animal kingdom that it's a crab that like makes a whole bunch of babies. So it can, we're not talking about cannibal crabs. Whatever. Sarah the Benevolent. Nonetheless, there are a lot of things that you can do with this. The simple truth of it is that you can just type in creature token, look through your collection, find cards that make creature tokens. I thoroughly enjoyed the human token thing that I was showing you where I was going over the human tokens, but you can also use the more recent core tokens, right? If you wound up actually buying or pulling uh, the Conqueror's Pledge, you can make so many core tokens and make really big angels out of these core tokens, right? If you've also got the Nahiri, Heir of the Ancients Vanguard, then you can actually go ahead and just keep out pumping out more and more and more of them. Uh, you can do some pretty wacky things, right? So there's a lot of ways that you can go. There are a lot of cards that produce tokens. So there's definitely, for pretty much everyone out there, a pretty good way to build this walker. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. And I'll see you in the next one.